Um, okay, great. So at this point, um, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Sklar. So Dr. Sklar is a professor in the College of Health Solutions and advisor to the provost at ASU. He is Distinguished Professor and Associate Dean Emeritus at the University of New Mexico, where he was a Chair of Emergency Medicine, Associate Dean NDIO for Graduate Medical Education, and the Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs. Dr. Sklar received his medical degree at Stanford and did an internal medicine residency at the University of New Mexico and an emergency medicine fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco. He has authored or co-authored over 200 articles in medical literature and written two books, La Clinica, a memoir about his time working in a rural Mexican clinic, and Atlas of Men, a prize-winning coming-of-age novel. He also happens to be lucky enough to be married to a colleague of ours here at ASU, Dr. Deborah Hellitzer, who's the Dean of the College of Health Solutions and has four children. Um, Dr. Sklar has also kindly agreed to stay during the break and answer any questions you may have about COVID or vaccines. So please uh, put any questions you have for him in the Q&A box and then he will stay on after and answer them for you. All right, Dr. Sklar, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. And um, so uh, as you just heard, I'm uh, a emergency physician and I actually take care of people who get COVID. Um, I also have unfortunately the bad luck of several family members who have had COVID, so I've had some personal experience, and I've also been vaccinated, so I can certainly talk about what that experience is all about. But before I begin, I do want to give some kudos to Dr. LeBaire, who you just heard. Uh, I, I think uh, what he has accomplished in a very short period of time is truly remarkable. He has developed a team. He's sort of the quarterback and the coach of our team. and I'm part of that team and has developed a resource for the whole state that uh, has been incredibly valuable. So kudos to Dr. LeBaire, and uh, I think we're so fortunate to have him and, and, to, and I'm fortunate to be part of that team. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about vaccines now because uh, I think that's what we're gonna really be uh, mostly focusing on. Uh, so vaccines, first thing about it is vaccines work. And um, as you can see here, when, when you have a vaccine, the disease really pretty much disappears. I actually have taken care of people who weren't vaccinated, who had some of these terrible diseases, such as tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, measles. So um, I'm old enough to have taken care of patients with these diseases. And in several cases, they died of them. Fortunately, now, um, those the worst of them, smallpox, tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, have pretty much disappeared. Uh, measles is is very little, and uh, polio has pretty much disappeared. Uh, influenza we still have, but um, the vaccines do work. Next slide. And because of vaccines, we're all living longer. So around the turn of the century of 1900, the average lifespan was about 50 years uh, in the U.S. And now it's about 80. And, and a large part of that is because of vaccination. Children are no longer dying of these uh, terrible diseases and they're living to adulthood and being able to live a long and uh, uh, hopefully healthy life. Next slide. Now we've heard a little bit about COVID and, and unfortunately COVID is a new disease. And so what that means is that we have not developed as a population, any immunity to it because it is new. So uh, when, when we get exposed to a disease, we develop antibodies. And in some cases, uh, babies are born and they get the antibodies from their mother or they get exposed at an early stage. And, uh, and that helps us fight off the worst effects of the disease. But COVID is new and we don't have any um, antibodies to it now. Next slide. And I think you've already seen from Dr. LeBaire's slides that we've been developing uh, several spikes or surges of uh, disease over the last year. Uh, each uh, surge I think uh, has, has been bad, but we I think hope that that would be the worst of it. Unfortunately, now we are in the throes of the worst surge. And uh, I'll come back to that in a moment because what I don't want us to do is think, okay, if we get the vaccine, now we can stop doing a lot of the things that really need to be done to reduce this current surge. I think uh, we're gonna to need to have the vaccine and continue 
some of the public health activities that will reduce our risk. Next slide. So what's a vaccine? Well, a vaccine is a substance that we give, uh, that it can be injected or it can be given orally or um, into the nose. And it um, stimulates our immune system by uh, bringing into the body uh, either a part of a virus or a bacteria that, that is similar to uh, what the actual virus or bacteria that um, causes the disease would, would create or would uh, introduce into the body. And so we then uh, develop antibodies uh, that will attack the actual virus or bacteria when uh, presented to us. So if we get the vaccine, and in uh, the best of cases, we will develop antibodies. And then if we get exposed to the actual virus or bacteria, we now have those antibodies that will attack the uh, virus or bacteria before it causes problems for us. And so therefore, um, we then don't have the severe symptoms or get very sick or die or anything like that. So um, vaccines, can prevent um, and, and or reduce the severity of a disease and then reduce the spread of that disease because we don't have, we're not coughing or sneezing. All right, next, uh, next slide. So there are uh, uh, four types of vaccines being developed right now. And I'll go through these just very briefly, mostly focusing on the last, which is the one that we're mostly uh, uh, that's what people are getting now in this country. Um, and uh, so the four types of vaccines are, first of all, the inactivated vaccine where we actually take the virus and kill it. And then uh, it will not be able to, to proliferate, but by then injecting it, we are able to then develop antibodies to the actual virus or bacteria or parts of the bacteria. But that's, that's an inactivated vaccine. Then there's protein-based vaccines where uh, some of the surface proteins from a virus or bacteria are injected. In this case, it would be the COVID uh, spike protein. And then that is used to stimulate our antibodies. Then there's the viral vector vaccine. So what happens is uh, some of the viral DNA is uh, actually put into another virus that uh, is not a dangerous virus. And then that virus is injected into the body. And then the DNA uh, creates RNA and then the proteins are produced that our antibodies uh, then respond to. And then the one that we now have is the gene-based vaccines. That's the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine that we're giving out right now in Arizona and all over the US. And in that case, we're, we're giving some of the uh, messenger RNA. Uh, it's actually in, it's, uh, injected into the body. And I'll show, I'll to show you how that works. But uh, as it gets into, and here's a picture of it, where the RNA is encased in a little um, fat nanoparticle. It's a little tiny uh, molecule that uh, carries the uh, RNA into the body and protects the RNA from being destroyed before it actually gets into the cells. And then that RNA produces uh, the uh, spike proteins, which then cause antibodies uh, to respond to those proteins, just as if we had an infection from the virus itself. So it's really quite a unique uh, type of vaccine. And because of the way it was developed, it was actually done very quickly. Uh, so that's, those are the uh, four kinds of vaccine, and this is the one that we're currently using. Next slide. Now, um, unfortunately, there are some complications and uh, some side effects from the vaccines. The most serious complication is anaphylaxis. It's very rare, but anaphylaxis, you may have heard of people who have really severe reactions from bee stings, or uh, they may be allergic to peanuts or something like that. And that's uh, a uh, reaction that the body has where uh, 
you develop a rash and difficulty breathing and sometimes the blood pressure will go down and you feel very sick. Uh, fortunately, it's very rare. Uh, I think there have been out of a million uh, doses, about 10 cases. And uh, the people who have had those really severe allergic reactions are usually people who have had other kinds of bad allergic reactions to other kinds of either food or again, bee stings or something like that. Many of them already have the EpiPen, which is the uh, way we counteract those allergic reactions. But it's also the reason why if you uh, get vaccinated, we'll ask you to stay for at least 15 minutes to make sure you don't um, become one of those people that have the anaphylactic reaction. And then if that were to happen, they have the medication right there at the site that they can administer so that uh, you'll be fine. In any case, that's, that's the most severe reaction. The more common types of reactions are not so severe. Usually uh, just soreness in your arm that develops about 12 hours after the injection. The injection itself is pretty painless, but uh, people will develop pain in your arm, uh, sometimes a little fever, weakness, achiness, things like that. And uh, most people have had those reactions uh, for the second uh, vaccination. The first one usually goes pretty well. The second one, uh, some people, maybe five or 10% will have more of these uh, side effects, but they, they last maybe a day or so. And if you take Tylenol, you're usually fine. So not, not, not a really bad reaction. Next slide. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, what we call uh, vaccine acceptance. It's really important that we get people to take the vaccine because that'll be our way of getting rid of this pandemic is to get everybody vaccinated. And there's a real variability in um, acceptability of vaccination based on countries. The US, about 60% of us are willing to be vaccinated, but another 30% or so are sort of on the fence. And hopefully as they watch others get vaccinated and not have any bad effects, they'll, they'll be willing. And then there's about 10% that are just really against getting vaccinated. And so our plan is really to try to get the 60% who want to get vaccinated to be able to get vaccinated, to make it easy to, so that there aren't really uh, impediments. And I'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. But uh, so that, uh, again, they get vaccinated. And then for the 30% who are on the fence to also be able to provide the information and hopefully uh, support from families and friends to get them vaccinated. And the 10% who don't want to get vaccinated, it may, that may be a, an uphill battle to, to convince them, but hopefully they'll eventually come around and, and do that. Next slide. So how do we uh, raise vaccine acceptance? And again, as uh, many of you who are involved in education, I think you'll, you'll have a very important role with that. You'll be developing trust among your colleagues and Eventually uh, with students, when they start to get vaccinated, we can't do that yet, but eventually we will, I think, um, you know, just being able to educate people about the vaccine. So developing trust is very important. And over the last few years, I think trust in our uh, whole system has been sort of uh, challenged by problems related to science and truth and so on. Well, so we need to rebuild that and do it through education. Also social media leadership, I think with the Biden administration coming in and, and requiring everyone to wear masks and providing leadership by showing that that's important. Uh, hopefully that will, uh, that will be helpful. And then, as I mentioned earlier, reducing the barriers so that when people actually get onto websites, they can actually get their appointment and, and feel confident that they'll get the vaccine and uh, making sure the logistics are really uh, very, very, uh, efficient so that when folks go to get the vaccine, there, there aren't long waits and, and that we're able to do it, um, do it well. So those are ways of, I think, improving vaccine acceptance. Next slide. Now I did mention children and uh, the tests uh, that were done on the vaccines uh, did not include children. So at this point, uh, the Pfizer vaccine has been approved uh, for children 16 and over, and Moderna is uh, 18 and over. So unfortunately, younger children, although there are tests 
now going on uh, to, shoot, to show that it's effective and safe in children. Uh, we uh, don't yet have approval to vaccinate children, but I think that'll probably come in the next few months. Next slide. So what do we need to do now? Well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, because the vaccine is surging in our community, we do need to continue to limit the current spread. And we are having uh, you know, five, six, eight, 10,000 new cases in Arizona every day. So we need to do the things that we know will reduce that spread, such as wearing masks, staying home as much as possible, social distancing, quarantine of people who are exposed or who have the illness, then making sure that we do vaccinate everyone uh, possible, trying to get to 80 or 90% immunity and doing that through education, social support and logistics. Uh, we also do need to provide good medical care for the people who do get sick and that's sort of what I do. So I take care of people who get very sick in the emergency department. And uh, I think we are doing better with that but uh, sadly, we are still losing people, some people who get really bad uh, cases of COVID and it's heartbreaking. Uh, whenever I go into the emergency department and see people who were healthy previously come in and are really suffering and then I, I can tell that they're probably not gonna make it. And it is really heartbreaking to see that. And, and it is real. That's why when people say, well, is this a hoax? Absolutely not a hoax, it's real. Uh, also providing financial support the people who get uh, COVID. Um, you know, I have a family member who works in the um, restaurant uh, uh, community and uh, uh, he got ill, he's a server and uh, didn't really have any uh, financial support from the restaurant where he worked. And so he had to take off two weeks from work, didn't get paid. And uh, you can see that it, that's really a disincentive for people to either be tested or to report or to quarantine because there's no financial support for them. And we need to do better on that. I, hopefully we will. And then we have to have health policies that really um, are more effective than, than what we've done so far. So I'm gonna uh, end there and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions. I'm really open to any questions you have, personal, clinical, vaccine, although this is about vaccine. This is really also your chance to talk about any questions you might have. Um, so Dr. Sklar, we do have a question here. So um, okay. between the first and second dose of the vaccine, if someone is displaying COVID-like symptoms, do they need to quarantine? Also, once vaccinated, if exposed, will they still need to quarantine? Yes, so the answer so far at this point is yes, and there's um, a few reasons for that. First of all, after the first vaccine, you are somewhat protected, but you're not totally protected. So you could get COVID after the first uh, vaccine um, and could then be spreading it. So if you do have, uh, if you have symptoms of COVID, you should get uh, quarantined and be tested. Now, the challenge is that some of the uh, side effects of the vaccination are similar to COVID. So for example, fever, achiness, those are all very similar to the actual disease. And so that can be a bit of a challenge. And so we do ask people who are having those, uh, those symptoms after they've been vaccinated uh, to uh, monitor themselves. And you know, if they continue to have those, uh, those symptoms that they should actually get tested and uh, quarantine and um, until their test is then um, found to be negative. But um, the answer is yes, you can. And you can also get the virus, uh, get, get the disease even after you've been fully vaccinated. It's not 100%, it's about 95%. So there are gonna be 5% of people who, can, uh, who will still get COVID even with vaccination. Great, thank you so much. So someone else asked, after having COVID, how long should someone wait to receive the vaccine? Yes, well, that's a great question. And um, as it turns out, uh, probably about 20% of our population in Arizona probably have had COVID. And what, what the recommendation is, is that you wait about 90 days or so. I would say, because we know that there is a fair amount of 
uh, protection after you've actually had the disease because you essentially created antibodies for most people who have it, they do create antibodies. Although it's probably less so if you had a asymptomatic case. So if you had COVID but had no symptoms, you, your antibody production is a little bit less. But still, you know, you are somewhat protected after you've had COVID. And so we recommend about a 90 day uh, period before you get the vaccination. And that also allows us to prioritize people who haven't had COVID to get the vaccine who have no protection. So that's, that's the recommendation at this point. Great, thank you. And one last question for you before we move on. Where is the science with getting vaccines for adolescents and teenagers? Yeah, so for adolescents and teenagers, if you're 16 and over, you can get uh, the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, and, and so it was tested uh, on groups like that, 18 for the Moderna. Uh, there are studies right now going on in younger children. I think probably uh, it will have it down to about age 12 soon. Uh, once that data is reviewed and analyzed. So I, I would anticipate in the next month or two that we'll be able to uh, include uh, children under, um, well, down to the age of about 12, but that, that hasn't yet been validated. That's what it looks like. And then hopefully younger children after that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sklar. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. And I know I certainly learned a lot from your presentation, so thank you so much. Yeah, well, good luck, everybody, and hope you learn a lot today.